you should see my uh, screen on the lower right, slides on the lower left, me, uh, upper middle, the attendee list for those of you who are curious on the upper right hand side, and the chat area on the left hand side. Feel free to chat away like crazy. Um, I'll be happy to have you do that. I'll be showing a bunch of stuff through this. The recording will be available. Um, and uh, in particular, I want to point you to, and I can, oh, I won't close Twitter. Um, I'll point you to this page on my website. It's www.downs.ca slash presentation slash 403. That's my presentation page for this event. The slides, the video, the audio, uh, these will be available after. If uh, you're in a room or something and you take a picture and you send it to me, uh, I'll even post a photo. And you can actually find all of my presentations on this site. I've done a few of them over the year. Here's another one uh, that I did a little while ago. And as you see, uh, when it's all done, it looks beautiful with the video, well, <laughs> my amateurish video and the slides and all of that. So there you go. Um, so uh, I'll give you the, the URL here for the presentation. In fact, I'll just put it right in the chat room and uh, then you can see it. And there it is. So what I want to talk about today is learning communities. It's funny, I was thinking about this. Uh, I did a talk, one of, one of my earlier talks actually in 2001 when I was in Australia and it was called Learning Communities. So it feels a little bit like I'm going full circle here, but this of course is going to be a much different talk than that. And what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the theory and then a little bit about the challenges and overall, the, the evidence for why we do it this way. And when I say why we do it this way, I'm talking about learning communities. I'm talking about MOOCs. I'm talking about distributed communities. I'm talking about connectivism, etc. cetera. And I'll, I'll cover some of that to begin with. Um, I know the, the overall theme is MOOCs for all, uh, MOOCs on the cheap and all of that. Uh, but, you know, there's a MOOC that covers how to make a MOOC really cheaply, uh, which kind of makes sense. Um, and then people like Donald Clark will be talking about how to add AI to your MOOC really cheaply. So, and that's, and all of those are, are worthwhile contributions and I don't want to duplicate them. So what I'm sharing with you today is basically the question that I've been wrestling with over the last little while, and I'll, I'll set some context for that and uh, you know, give you a sense of where my thinking is. Uh, it's not going to be a polished, here's everything kind of presentation. It's, it's a little bit like me thinking aloud. But as you can see, I'm kind of set up presentation style anyway, so I hope you get uh, some actual content out of this too. So having said that, uh, let's move into the theory itself of what it is that we're up to. Um, and where I begin is with the question of what is education, well, actually you know, being a philosopher, I even go back a bit further than that, and I begin with the question, what is knowledge? Because, you know, I mean, education is all about giving us knowledge or helping us get knowledge or something to do with knowledge, and we need to know what that is. And there's a traditional view of knowledge and there's a contemporary view of knowledge. And the traditional view of knowledge is that it's a pile of facts. And you go out into the world and you look for facts. And there's this whole process of interacting with the environment, testing, coming up with hypotheses, um, testing those hypotheses, confirming them, disconfirming them, etc. Um, when I was studying philosophy, we called that logical positivism. And this is the view that still, to a large degree, informs education today. When the constructivists talk about making meaning and, and constructing knowledge or constructing a representation, this is kind of what they're up to. And when we talk about 
evidence for success and testing and evaluation. All of this is kind of what we're up to as well. But I've done a lot of work in the sciences and I've done a lot of work in philosophy and, and I'm a researcher, properly so called. Um, and what I've concluded, and not just me, many others have concluded, including philosophers like Byron, Lactose, Loudon, and others, uh, is that science and knowledge and learning don't work that way. Um, and, and here's something from Reinhardt. Science has a combination of evaluating evidence, coordinating evidence and models, and arriving at evidence-based judgment that are communicated through argumentation. There's a lot more going on in science than going out looking at the phenomenon and saying, here's a fact about the world. And it's a mess, honestly. Uh, it's a mess in the sense that there's no such thing as a simple fact. There's no such thing as a simple observation. In our own heads, uh, there's this densely connected network of memories, perceptions, beliefs, desires, ideas, pains and pleasures and whatever. All of these informing our view. And everybody has one of those and they're all different and society as a whole is a mess of an effort for us to communicate these things with each other. And education plops right into the middle of that. So it can't just be the presentation of facts. At least that's what I conclude, right? And, and that's what a lot of people conclude. So George Siemens and I, many years ago, prehistory now, came up with the first MOOC, and we designed it in the connectivist model. Um, and you're seeing in the slide there a couple of pictures, a connectivist MOOC. A MOOC is a web, not a website. And the idea here is that the connectivist MOOC would emulate this knowledge environment that I've just described. And as you can see, it's not a nice, neat, linear order of facts. It's a mess. It's got all kinds of participants with different points of view, bringing in different resources, sharing, exchanging these resources, arguing it out, and each person gets something different from the MOOC, and instead of transmitting knowledge from expert to novice, the MOOC as a whole creates new knowledge that was a surprise to all of us, including the instructor. And the idea here is that the participation and the engagement in this process really is taking part in the same sort of process of discovery that contemporary science does. We as learners discover the world the, pretty much the same way scientists as learners discover the world. It's just we may be at different levels, the phenomena that we're looking at maybe more basic, but the methodology is more or less the same. There are differences, and that's the subject for a whole other talk, but uh, you know, it's not like we have one completely different process for learning and another completely different process for science. I'd belabor that because that's not necessarily an obvious point. So how do you set that up? Well, more recently, over the last five years or so, I've been focused on this idea of personal learning. And I draw a distinction between personal learning and personalized learning. Everybody's talking about personalized learning, but what personalized learning is the presentation of content, but in a unique order for each individual. So, and in the end, we'll all get to the same place anyways. Personalized learning differs finds an ideal state of learning, uh, where we should be, but we're not yet, right? So we're some gap away from that ideal state. And we'll find out if the person is at this ideal state by being tested. So how do we get there? First, we deliver some content based on the individual, and then we do a test or an assignment or an exercise. and we're evaluated, there's that gap, and based on that gap, we go back and we get new content. And we do this, it's personalized because we do this individually for each person. 
Now, I want to be clear. This is way better than just reading something aloud at the front of a classroom. Way better. But it's still rooted in this positivist tradition of knowledge as a set of facts and individuals acquiring and filling up this gap. And it's based on the idea that the learning system will do the learning for you. You just follow the steps and it'll happen. Personal learning isn't like that. Uh, personal learning is we as individuals define where we want to be, a desired state. We try, we do some practice, we write some code, we draw a picture, whatever, based on the affordances of our environment. And as you can see, I messed around with Adobe Connect here. Adobe Connect has certain affordances. It lets me make the chat room big. It lets me show my website. And I just messed around with it to see what I could do. And that produces the content. This talk is the content, right? So I'm practicing. I'm playing around with some technology here. I'm practicing. Every time I give a talk, I'm practicing. And I try it out. And people give me feedback. Uh, if there were an instructor here, the instructor would give me feedback. And the idea here is that they are trying to help me do a better presentation. We practice, and then it's not like a coach who's a guide by the side. It's more like a coach who watches what you do, corrects you when you're wrong, um, you know, models and demonstrates correct practice so that you have an idea of what you're up to. And, but, and the main thing is they're not trying to test you. They're trying to help you. And that produces an iteration, and then we try it again. So that's the model that I've been working with over the, especially the last couple of years. I don't really like calling it a model, but that's a separate debate. Um, but I will say, it's not that I, it's not that I believe the model is a representation of reality. The model is a tool that I use to talk about the world. It isn't the world itself. So it, it's, it's an abstraction that tries to give you a sense of what I'm actually thinking. Terrible explanation, but you know, separate issue. So this leads to different approaches in, in learning. Uh, on the one hand, on the left, we have the traditional approach, which is learning design. Um, and I can refer even to learning design with a capital L, capital D, which is the IMS global specification. I can talk about uh, James Dalzell's learning activity management system, which is based on learning design. A lot of the automated course authoring systems in, in LMSs, which are based on learning design. Even the authoring system in, in applications like edX and, and you know, the X MOOC applications are based on learning design. The dominant metaphor is a path or a course or a sequence where you move through the sequence. If it's personalized adaptive learning, you don't just go in a straight line. You might go in loops. There might be branches and choices and things like that. But you're still you know, walking through the course, right? Uh, there's thresholds, levels, grades, uh, scores, leveling up, all of that if you're gamifying it. There's positioning. You might be first in your class, last in your class. These positioning things are very important right? because everybody's trying to get to this one same goal, this ideal state that's been predefined. So some people are ahead and some people are behind. That's your objective, your target. And of course, your instructor is out there in front or behind, wherever they are, pushing you toward that end. The other model is the model that we used to design MOOCs. It's a model of an environment. The idea of a curriculum here isn't a set of facts. It's more like a map of the area, and that's just a metaphor. But the idea is you pick and choose from the map. There's no such thing as, I mean, there is such a thing as reading a map, but if you actually read a map, you don't start at one end and go to the other end and, and finish. That would be kind of absurd. Uh, there, there isn't really any sense of finishing a map. What is it to, you know, you open up Google Maps. What would it be to complete 
Google Maps. That makes no sense, right? Uh, there's the core, which is the area you're interested in, uh, and then there might be a periphery, uh, and people are like that too. So there'll be a core of people and people on the periphery, and they're coming in and coming out or whatever. It's based not on this idea of movement through content, but uh, inquiry, discovery, gaps, but gaps not in the sense of you haven't acquired this, but gaps in the sense of I'm trying to get this done and it's still not quite working. There's convergence, coverage, construction, clustering, the sorts of things that you would expect people to do in an environment. And when they get together and they do stuff with the various affordances that they have, you get serendipity, you get emergence, you get new knowledge that results from this interaction. Two totally different pictures of learning. And, and this design versus environment list comes from Kerry Pitcher. Uh, I've stolen it, but it really does reflect the kind of thinking that we had in mind. So what I did over the years is I put together various aspects of what I think is method as discovery. So this is the idea of what we're actually doing in a MOOC. We're not following a sequence of facts to some predefined ideal state. We're in this environment. We're interacting together. We're discovering. We're building. We're creating. And that's the way science does it. That's the way we learn as individuals. That's the way we learn as a society. And, you know, I, I look out there in this building, there are like real scientists there using like lasers and, uh, and chemicals and, and, and machines. And this is kind of what they're doing. And it's funny because you see this constant tension between we want you to build a widget and the scientists saying, well, maybe that's what will come out of my research, maybe not. I don't know. Let me mess around with these chemicals. We'll try this. We'll try that. We'll try to produce some result, but you know we don't really know what we're going to find because it's science. It's you know research, and learning is like that. So I, I sometimes think of it also as being similar to learning a language. You know, and again, what is it to complete learning a language? I'm still learning English. It's a tough language. Um, and, you know, I've worked on other languages, especially French, over the years. And I've discovered that you don't learn a language, you discover it. You explore it. You have to get yourself immersed in it, speak it, listen to people speaking it. You can't just do it formally. Uh, you can't be told what French is and then believe that you can speak French. It doesn't work like that. So my scientific method, I go to the office each day and I immerse myself in my world, doing things like this presentation. So the diagram there shows the three aspects. Again, it's, it's just a, a thinking object, not a model or representation of the way the world really is. So the different skills involved in working in this sort of environment aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. Uh, the different literacies for not just talking and communicating with each other, but for understanding the world itself, the way we interrogate the environment. Syntax, semantics, context, use, cognition, change. And then finally, the values, the things that guide the construction of or the development of these environments, autonomy, diversity, openness, and interaction. And I've talked about all of these at length in the past. Um, and these, these are based on uh, the evidence that I've seen, working online, messing around. Uh, they're all, of course, subject to empirical confirmation, but again, it's not the sort of thing, well, I'll go out, you know, and I'll, I'll use the hypothetical deductive method and we'll control for all the variables and see, you know, how about autonomy? How does that work? Because everything is interrelated. And that leads me to my problem. How do we know? How do we know this works? Um, and, you know, 
I presented, I was, I was at a forum on MOOCs on the Isle of Capri for the European Multiple MOOC Aggregator Project, uh, Federici University in Naples, presented this, and uh, someone in the audience sat back and very politely listened and said, yeah, let's, I've heard this from you before, which is true. Where's the evidence? How do you know it works? And that's a hard question because, again, I can't just go and do a controlled study because a controlled, controlled study isn't going to tell me the important things that I need to know. And there's a variety of reasons for that. One, one reason, for example, each person is different. Um, yeah, there are some similarities, but you can't base what you're doing in education on those similarities. You know, at, at the gross level, you can't, right? Uh, you know, people can read, or sorry, people can see and people can hear, at least most people. So you can present stuff that they can look at and give them content that they can hear. Um, but, you know, the, as soon as you get past that, right, uh, what language are you going to present it in? What vocabulary are you going to use? What level of vocabulary are you going to use? What kind of metaphors will you use? What kind of examples? Would, I love baseball, would a baseball metaphor work with this audience? You know, as soon as we get beyond the obvious generalities, and, and, and our field is full of these obvious generalities, and to the individual person, it becomes less and less likely that the observations and generalities that we can make in controlled experience, experiments actually work. It's like medicine, right? Um, we don't just send people into a hospital environment where they prescribe the same treatment for everyone, um, not even if they have the same symptoms. We actually have a human, a doctor, sometimes a nurse or nurse practitioner, depends on the symptoms, interact with them and find out what the context is, what the history is, etc., to determine which of many different alternative treatments ought to be tried. And I emphasize tried. Uh, particularly, you know, if, if, if you got a cold, okay, that's one thing, but if you got one of those really weird things that they studied on house, there's one of those cultural culturally based uh, references, then you've got to sit and think about it for quite a while. And education is that way a lot as well. So how do we know? Well, what does success even look like? You know, the old model, and, and they still do this a lot, in fact, this is pretty much the way they measure success, is they determine some content that you are supposed to learn. They give you that content and various activities in order to inculcate that content. And then they test you to see if you got that content. But what if there's no particular content that people need to learn? This is the case anytime you deviate from the idea that there is one ideal state at the end of the learning sequence. This ceases to be the case anytime you have a definition of learning that is based on personal needs, personal interests, personal outcomes. Uh, in other words, personal learning cannot be evaluated by success in tests or things like that. So, okay. So what are the success factors? Look at the slide here. There's retention. Okay. Uh, did they stick it out? Uh, did they get past the first day? Uh, even in this presentation, right? I'll, I'll evaluate this presentation. And, you know, are you still in the room? Right? We started with 11. We're up to 20 now. All right. Yep, I'm succeeding. If I, if I went down to three, I'd know. Okay. Uh, either the internet has failed in Europe or you know, things aren't going so well. Um, Lifespan, and this is a tricky one. I'm going to come back to this. I have another slide here. Um, but, you know, if a learning event 
it, it's sort of related to retention, right? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that. But I've got a slide, it's just a wee bit about the stages of the mailing list. What else? Engagement and interaction. Well, how are we doing? We've got our 20 participants still. Uh, we've got a couple of comments coming up here. Uh, let's check the uh, Twitter feed. We've got six new results. Cool. And there's a photo. Oh, and my slides are coming in beautifully. That's nice to see. Thank you, Maria. Um, so, uh, so okay. So we got six. That's that's not a hundred, but a hundred might be a little hard to handle. This this can be an issue. Then that's cool. I have no problem with that. Uh, again, Dave Cormier, who did Ed Tech Talk for years and years and years, told me one time that uh, you know they, they get a smallest group of people on Ed Tech Talk. And then they get a ton of people come and listen to the recordings. Uh, it's just a lot more convenient to do it that way. And I find that that's the case with the presentations as well. I'll have 20 people here. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll have 200, 300 people view the video after. Uh, that's the way it works. Uh, shares, referrals. These are all kind of success factors. They're, they're not really direct measurements, are they? Um, Here's the lifestyle, life cycle of a mailing list, and you might like this. So, well, I, I used mailing list because mailing lists have come and gone, and so we've been able to see the complete life cycle. So you have the founding of the list, and I don't, don't know if you can see my mouse on this screen, but um, you have the founding of the list, and people are very enthusiastic. You don't need rules because everybody's already on the same page, both of them, right? Uh, you have enthusiasts. It's a new technology, maybe, or a new community, or something like that. Um, and people become evangelists for it. They even start advertising for this list on other lists, and they say, you should join www.dev or whatever, right? And as over time, you begin to get more people, you begin to get informal rules, like uh, norming, as they've called it. Uh, <laughs> do some not plateau at an acceptable level, or do they all die? My experience, Brian, they all die. Uh, they're not all dead, obviously, just like people are not all dead, but um, I think they all die uh, over time. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that. You get to these mature discussions, and this is the list in its prime. And it doesn't necessarily sit at the peak for only a short time. Sometimes, you know, it's there for a little while. But eventually, there, you know, there begins to be some fraying around the edges. Uh, you know, especially if it gets popular. It's not necessarily going to get popular, but if it does then people start wanting to announce events and it always begins right well you can announce your your own personal non-commercial event and then people say well this is my personal non-commercial event but really it was a commercial webinar uh and and then people start sticking plugs in for their product or their website or whatever and so you have to have policies and especially if the number of people is growing and then you have enforcement of the policies then you have debates and moderation uh, meanwhile whether or not this is happening uh, people invest in this list in the sense of they begin to spend more and more time and the jargon gets deeper and deeper and deeper and often what will happen is you'll get two, three, maybe four people become the contributors who contribute pretty much all of the content to the list, all the content that isn't conference announcements, calls for papers, things like that. Um, and at that point, all pretense of following the rules is gone. Most of the people have abandoned the list. And finally, the list consists only of conference announcements and calls for paper and if it goes on further than that and sometimes they do it degenerates into nothing but spam I can I'm, so many lists I've seen have done that and I would not call them failures because of that right uh, when they were in their prime uh, they were 
great. Uh, www.dev, right? www.edu. The DOS-L mailing list. And, uh, and there's a half a dozen more that I can think of. All went through this cycle. Uh, right now, uh, IT Forum was an excellent list that degenerated into nothingness. Um, and you see this in these communities generally. And, and depending on the technology, um, the more recent the technology, the earlier are in this life cycle. So what is the measurement here for success, non-success? Well, it could be the time between the founding and the, the no rule stage near the end. So that's a duration measure. It could be the height at its peak of how much participation there was. Uh, it could be an examination of the mature discussions themselves. We're looking at, uh, you know, uh, tech, uh, what do we call that, natural language processing. So we can actually look at the content of what they talked about and ask, you know, was this actually useful stuff, etc. Let's have a look. Uh, tuning in late. Oh, well, okay. Telltales, welcome to the group. Um, you know, the different ways you look at it like this are different ways we can evaluate it. Oh, well, daily. It's funny about OO Daily and my website in general. So let's, let's look at the life cycle. Right? From founding till now, well, it's still going on. Okay, so we're, we're not into the two people monopolizing the list yet. But the height is kind of, it's kind of odd. There's a good readership, which has been steady at 20,000 or so for 10 years. So a long, flat peak. Right, um, but there's not really a lot of discussion. There's me with my posts, but the discussion, you know, I don't have hundreds of comments in my discussion list. I never have, right? Uh, George Coros does, Alex Coros does, uh, other people do, but I don't. I don't know, uh, etc. So. It's a question of how you evaluate it. Has OL Daily been a success? Uh, in terms of traffic, it's been a runaway success. I get millions of hits. Um, well, we can, we can check now, actually. Uh, 2016 stats. Let's have a look. So, so for the month of September, 74,000 unique visitors, 137,000 visits, so not much repeat visiting. Um, 707,000 pages, uh, 2.8 million hits, etc. And that's, that's up. It's interesting. I stopped using Facebook in uh, late August, and that's when the traffic started going up. So I find that very interesting. Um, and so on. And, you know, these hits have been more or less consistent over the years. It's sort of slowly going up. This is real traffic, right? There's, you know, you get a lot of spam traffic and search engines and that, and this filters all of those out. So, but is that what makes it a success? I don't know. It's a good question. Did I just kill my Twitter? I did. Let's bring that back up. Oops, search. Oops, okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, here's something I found from Diana Esparza on measuring competency-based education. Competency-based education is more like personalized learning, where you're trying to get to this ideal state, than it is like personal learning. But it's also the kind of thing is kind of difficult to measure directly. And in competency-based education, it often happens in a workplace setting or a project-based setting where you're trying to achieve some sort of outcome other than just learning stuff. So here we have Diana uh, Esparza saying, you know, project execution, 
data sampling, performance, and business results. And this, this actually almost reminds me of some of the higher levels of the Kirkpatrick scale of assessment, especially on the business results, return on uh, learning investment, things like that. Um, so, okay, if you have one of these communities and the company makes more money, that might be an indicator. But of course, the company might have made more money because the com competitor went bankrupt. So there's all kinds of other things. Uh, Jenny saying it's very hard to measure what is successful about OL Daily. I use it and click through at least three times per week. And I publish five times per week. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, I, I know it's it's it, it is a hard thing to measure. Um, this image comes from, uh, and you might want to follow this link, um, again, the slides will be available on that website. Uh, you might want to follow that link to Pearson Education, which is talking about the changing and diverging roles of faculty in uh, a competency-based learning environment, because it's no longer, you know, just teacher talks, everyone absorbs content. So, okay. Those are ways. Let's think about then why we're doing this. You know, that's that's the obvious next question, right? So we want to translate active learning into something that is meaningful and lasting. Okay, I get that. I don't want to just repair motorcycles. I want to learn something from repairing motorcycles. Maybe Zen. Maybe how to repair my motorcycle. Maybe both. Uh, the students need to reflect in action about the learning process itself. And that's one of the things that the network approach really promoted because you were always talking about what you were learning, how you were learning it, as well as just trying to get the content. Because the first question in a connectivist environment, a network environment, is what content am I going to use? And what content you're going to use depends on what you want to do and how you'll know you've done it. And that depends on each individual person. Effectiveness might result from planning. Uh, I made the comment the other day that uh, you know, autonomous learning can work. And because there have been various people saying, you know, autonomous learning can't work. People can't learn on their own. Well, there's all kinds of evidence that speaks against that. For example, um, games. Uh, MIST, M-Y-S-T, famous game, very involved, difficult to play. People played it on their own and figured it out because the game was well designed and it stepped you through. So learning design does matter, but not learning design in the sense of learning design. It's more like learning design in the sense of environmental design. You, know, you create affordances. The affordances make it possible to learn things by interacting with the environment. So there's my life cycle of the mailing list. Brian has just shared it on Twitter. Oops. Just scroll Twitter instead of my slideshow. There's also, and this is this was a terrific study that I ran across preparing for this talk. It's from 2010. It's called Scaling Up Learning Communities, the Experience of Six Community Colleges. It's long, it's a hundred and some odd pages, but it's a great read. And, and you'll want to have a look at that. And Here's what they said are the factors that contributed to the success of their communities. First, a paid coordinator and committed college leaders. If you go back to my mailing list, which is over here on the website, uh, that's the founding bit, right? There's always this core of enthusiasts. And everything I've ever looked at online, every learning project, every community, every mailing list, every discussion list, there's a person, maybe two or three, as it was in you know, the connectivist courses, who are at the core of this, who are pushing this. And when they go, that's the end of the, that's, you know, that's the end of the list. That's how I know these things all die, because we all die. 
And one time gone, that's it for OL Daily. It doesn't matter how successful it was. It's done. It's had its run. Um, a lot of lists leave, die sooner than that. But when they die, if you look at what happened, it was because the people who originally founded it lost interest, went and did something else. As coordinators clarified expectations and offered support, faculty responded by changing their teaching practices. The thing has impact. That's really important. Um, I don't know how to measure that. And again, I think it's one of these things that's different for each person. Take IT Forum, for example. Uh, they, their method was they had a paper every, every two weeks, I think it was, They'd post a paper, and then people on the list would discuss it. I did that once. It was one of the last papers ever to be posted. I think there was one or two after mine, and that was it. Uh, just kind of, I don't know what to think about that. But, of course, you know, these papers would have an impact. This impact would ripple through the community, etc. Curricular integration remained difficult to implement widely and deeply. That should not surprise you at all, because curriculum... You know, your typical college course is one thing, a community is another thing. They're doing different things. Uh, but student cohorts led to strong relationships among students creating both personal and academic support networks. This is something I've wrestled with over the years. Um, how important is the cohort? How important is not just the interaction. We know the interaction is important, but... How important is the sense, what Terry Anderson calls presence, other people call belonging. Um, how important is that? I argued about it in a, in a paper called Groups and Networks. The network part is based on the interaction. Um, it's based on diversity, autonomy, openness. The group part is based on unity, oneness, uh, commonality of meaning, etc., etc. And I've always preferred the network, but I see in a lot of places the importance of these personal attachments, the group thing. So there's a question here, a question I haven't resolved to my satisfaction, although I still lean toward the network side of it. What are the best practices? So here we go. A culture that supports collaboration. I would say a culture that supports cooperation. Collaboration, everybody works toward one objective. Cooperation, people work together, but each person has an individual and distinct ob objective. That seems more like personal learning to me. Uh, the ability to take an objective or macro view of school efforts instead of focusing on one small thing. And then, again, shared beliefs and behaviors. This is the group thing. This is everybody working together as one thing. How important is that? In an institution, in a formal setting, I think it's probably pretty important. Is it important in an informal setting? Do you, for example, require groups in order to have a good time playing a video game? Or can you play them as individuals? Obviously, both work. So this one's a bit hard to read, but key elements of comprehensive learning and learning communities. This is that same paper that I referenced earlier, and they're focusing on curricular integration, active collaborative learning, faculty collaboration, student engagement, and the integration of student support services. So we see two aspects here. First of all, the whole web-like structure of this thing. We're Everything is integrated into this thing. But on the other hand, it's also the group thing. Everybody is working toward the same thing. So there's this commonality of objective. But this commonality of objective, as I have argued over the years, is counter to what we really want from an education system. So where's my evidence? Well, my evidence, quote unquote, is the years of experience I've had over you know, on, online looking at and watching these things. Now, again, I haven't sat down and 
tried to formalize this study. I'm not sure it's possible to. Maybe it is. I mean, people like Sherry Churchill have done it. Uh, but I, I don't necessarily believe all their results. Um, you know, people, people talked, well, I, let me, let's just look at some of these communities and we'll look at them. So one of them, here's outcome mapping is a community. Uh, it's basically, is development, um, international development, and the idea here, like many of these communities these days anyways, you have to join them to see any of the stuff. So here we are, we're in the community, uh, and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, well, okay, well, let's see our, our measures of effectiveness, where the discussions and all of that. So we've got discussions, 962 topics, 3,248 posts. The most recent post was uh, last Thursday, so seven days ago. That's not that recent. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this as a community, maybe it's a bit past its prime. Um, if we, if we look at, uh, you know, the view cases on map, so these are the different cases, uh, outcome mapping cases that they've studied over the year, over the years, that looks fairly significant to me. Um, if we look at, those. was a, yeah, the user map there. You can see it on the slide. I'm looking for it on the site. Uh, members, view on map. Look, at, here's the membership. And what strikes me about this membership, not simply that there's a lot, but they're distributed all over the world. Now, yeah, there's some clustering in Europe and the United States, but there's also clustering in India, in East Africa, in Southwest Africa, in Mexico and Latin America. So very widely distributed. Now to evaluate this more fully, we'd actually have to go into the discussions and, and look at are these discussions, you know, are they like slash dot where the thing is you know, first post, I'm second, I'm third, you know, stuff like that, or the comments on YouTube which are so bad I won't even talk about them. Or here we have what is a fairly substantial thing. but. It's a request for a contribution, so I'm kind of like a call for surveys, you know. Uh, but now we have, but but it's but it's also a discussion, etc. The comments are reasonably detailed. Uh, they're using a fairly high level of vocabulary. There are replies to them. All of these are things that say to me that this community, at least in the past and maybe in the present. Uh, has been a success. And this community instantiates many of the things that I've talked about over the years. An example I've used a lot in prehistory, from prehistory, is beekeeping. And that's because of a paper that Aaron Brewer gave at the Open Learning Conference back in, uh, I believe it was 2004, talking about the beekeeping group on Yahoo Groups. And she did a study of that and talked about the interaction. And again, it's one of these things, right? You can't generalize. Uh, you look at this community, this community works in a certain specific way. Maybe you'll find patterns. You'll probably find patterns, but there aren't going to be universal principles. But anyhow, she studied this. Now, Yahoo Groups basically doesn't exist, but beekeeping still does. So I wanted to see what was out there. And so we have, I, I searched around, one of the things I found was the Toronto Beekeepers Collective, and that's also related to the Toronto District Beekeeping Association, etc. Now they're in the middle of rebuilding their website. This is, depending on how long this notice has been up, uh, this is either really good news or really bad news. Uh, the events though, if you look at the upcoming events, uh, is pretty blank. So I was discouraged by that. The members area, the members forum, I didn't sign up for this list because I don't keep bees and so it'll probably be a misrepresentation to join this community. The other group, the uh, Beekeepers Association, they actually approve their memberships. 
Uh, but you know, Aaron Brewer's comments were were about you know the discussion list. So here's the Google group uh, for scientific sci.agriculture.beekeeping. Uh, 30 is showing 30 of 12,000 topics, 99 of which are unread, 99 plus of which are unread, uh, make that pretty much almost all of them. Uh, again, though, the last post is the 4th of September. Um, I looked through this and we've got, well, spam. <laughs> Uh, somebody has been slamming this list with solution manual this, solution manual that, download 5,000 solution manuals, etc. Now, of course, Google should be ashamed of itself uh, for doing nothing, uh, but Google is terrible at blocking spam. And, and Google, I think, has done more to harm communities over the years than it's done to help communities, oddly enough. Um, I say that and we're using YouTube Live, but there you go. Um, let's look at another one, though. Drones Discuss, this is earlier in the life cycle, right? Um, and so we've, but, you know, 19th of May is the most recent topic. But 12th of October, that's, that's not last year, that's just a few days ago. So this is a pinned post, so we don't want to depend on it. 12th of October, that's yesterday. 10th of October, that's a couple days ago. So this is an ongoing group. Um, you know, 3,300 topics, so quite a bit uh, going on here. Not deep discussions, but useful resources. So you can see that it is kind of working. Here's one that's really successful, Stack Overflow. Now, nobody goes into Stack Overflow via the front page, especially since everything looks like you know, zero votes, zero answers. Here's what happens with Stack Overflow. People do a very highly specific search on Google. I got error 452 on this module. And they do a search, Stack Overflow comes up, and there's a bunch of answers. And there's one answer, I'm not even going to find one of these on the front page. Uh, and there's one answer that is the top answer, and it's a good answer. The thing is, with Stack Overflow, people are able to vote the answers up and down. And so the good content flows to the top. And there's, so there's a minimum of spamming because nobody's going to read it. Um, so there is that element. TensorFlow. TensorFlow is uh, an artificial intelligence library created by Google but released into open source. And it might be one of the ones that Donald Clark talks about next week. TensorFlow can be used to do things like natural language analysis, etc. Uh, it enables researchers to build machine learning modules. Now, the community isn't on the website. And I find this really interesting. The community is on a site called GitHub. GitHub is a site that allows people to create and post uh, programs. And it allows other people to contribute to the programs. It allows people to, uh, what they call, fork the program and take an existing program and create a new version of it and do something different with it. GitHub is an enormously successful uh, community. And I'm trying not to rush, and I'm trying to rush at the same time. It's an interesting dance that I'm doing. Um, Sterling Engines, and uh, I wanted you to see the Sterling Engine. This is uh, on the screen here. This is a Sterling Engine that runs on the warmth of a hand. There is a whole Sterling Engine community out there, although there's pretty much no central place for it. This community exists completely in terms of YouTube videos, posts, websites, etc. There is a, a Google Plus community on Sterling Engines, but it's not that great. DeviantArt. Again, a hugely successful community, nowhere near the end of the group life cycle. It's still at the peak. It's been at the peak for years. Uh, 40 million members, 337 million original works of art, 
I took a bit of a chance displaying the website uh, live here in this presentation, but as you can see, I got away with it. Nothing bad. Sometimes there's stuff that's bad. Enormously successful. So you sort of see the sort of things that are working, right? Things that allow people to contribute, things that allow people to, to define their own objectives, people, things that allow people to interact, to comment on each other's work, to rate it, to criticize it, getting this feedback. DS106, for example, is another one. I didn't list it, but it's another one. Um, here's the similar sort of thing, but it's done as a government project by British Columbia, uh, and basically it allows people to complete their K-12 education by exploring their interests and taking the lead in their own learning and life. This is probably a talk in itself. But again, it's the same idea. World of Warcraft. I mentioned the game stuff earlier. Um, this is another example of what I meant here. Uh, people organize themselves in World of Warcraft into massive guilds. They choose specialties. They create dashboards, not in the game, but dashboards on websites. There are discussion lists, Google groups, YouTube, etc., etc., etc. Speaking of YouTube, here's what's going on right now in YouTube. We're doing YouTube Live, but people are playing games in YouTube and broadcasting them live, and they are commenting with each other. So this is somebody playing, I'm not sure what it is, uh, could be No Man's Sky. That's what I've been playing recently, which is why I put it up here. There are communities being based around these games, but not simply based around the games, uh, but just communities that are forming, and they'll go from game to game to game. Uh, and I sort of almost was, anyhow. So those are the communities. They're just examples, right? Um, but you know, when you see enough of these, and you see enough of them that work, at a certain point, you stop asking, are they successful? What is the evidence that they're successful? And you begin to look at, why is this successful? What makes this successful? And that's what we've been trying to get at with connectivism, uh, and what I've been trying to get at with personal learning environments, and, and all the theory and the different models, and etc. that I outlined at the top of this talk. Now, my account of the success might be correct, might not be correct. Depends, right? It depends on what actually happens out there in the world. And, you know, you put it out there, you argue it out, you draw out your examples, etc. A good example of this is the choral explanations that Michael Caulfield presents. And what he says is everybody brings their own take to the environment, their own style, their own need to the project including their own patterns, their own design ideas, etc. And what comes out of that is an explanation based not on one authoritative source, but an explanation based on, as, as Michael Caulfield says, the chorus. I think he's right. That's what we tried to do in the connectivism course. That's what we see in DeviantArt and World of Warcraft and, and the Sterling Engine community and GitHub and on and on it goes. Yeah, you, you still need organization. You still need the people, the support, whether it's the government, whether it's an enthusiast, whether it's a teacher or professor or whatever. But And you need an environment of some kind. These things, you know, it's hard to do this in air. Um, without the internet, these would happen, you know, they'd be community gardening associations, things like that. Uh, but that's what they are, and that's how they work. And so that's where I'm at in my thinking. Um, not I completed, we're all done. Uh, but, you know, and so I'm looking at things like Code Academy, which doesn't have the interaction. Does that work? Well, maybe. Uh, looking at uh, SlideShare, which you know is now part of LinkedIn, and they're trying to tie it to jobs and competencies and all of that, and that's kind of interesting. 
And of course, I'm looking at Twitter and the discussion of which has kind of died over the last 20 minutes or so. What should I say about that? So there you have it. Um, that's my talk, and uh, I thank you for your time and your attention. Sorry I went five minutes over. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, as I said, I just put up a message. If anyone wants to actually use a mic, um, uh, put up your hand, and I can give you microphone permissions. Otherwise, maybe type in some questions there. Uh, that was extremely fascinating. It reminds me of what was that um, science fiction novel where uh, we're trying. We started talking about community learning, but really you're talking about life, the universe, and everything. You know. Uh, uh, maybe just to kick off some questions, I might. Uh, uh, actually, I'm here in Southern New Hampshire University, and I was talking to somebody this morning while waiting for this talk all about College for America, which is a competency-based program based on project-based learning. And I, I do believe that it has a lot in common. I sort of feel I've been learning like this for 20 years since we got the internet. I think it was 20 years ago in Sligo. But nobody's given me a PhD, and I know lots of stuff. So there is this tension between driving your own learning through your own communities and getting credit for it. Um, now, I'm not looking for a PhD, but there are lots of younger people looking for qualifications. So, Stephen, would you comment maybe on how you feel this community-based learning links to accredited learning? Or do you think maybe accredited learning undermines real learning? Well, there's an issue with accredited learning, and the issue is um, it defines this ideal learning state that everybody needs to aspire to. And so it goes back into that traditional content-based kind of model, right? And you're either, you know, there's this gap between what you need to get this, this certificate and what you have. And it might not have anything actually to do with what the person wants to do, but they need the certificate to get a job. Because, you know, people aren't necessarily looking for the recognition in and of itself. The recognition uh, is a tool that you do, that you use for other things, like to get a job or, or like to be able to join a professional association or whatever. In a lot of these online communities, uh, this isn't necessary anymore. And it's not necessary anymore because people are contributing their own original work and they're doing it in an environment where everybody can see it. GitHub is a classic example of that. You can look at the profile of an individual person. You can see how many uh, changes they've made to code over the years, how many projects they've initiated, etc. You can actually look at the code they wrote, and if you're a good programmer, you can tell whether or not this person is a good programmer just by looking at them. Same with DeviantArt, right? Uh, let, let's go to DeviantArt, right? Uh, where'd it go? There it is, right? So look at that uh, person in the upper left. Are they a good artist? I'd say so, right? Looks pretty good to me. Um, you know, it look, looks a lot better than this uh, picture in the lower row of the sunset. It's a nice picture, but it's not as good as the drawing, uh, you know, etc. right? I, and we could go through here and, you know, and the thing is, everybody does this individually. So I could look at a couple of dozen people on DeviantArt and give them ratings. And if... 100,000 people do that, now we've got ratings spread out across all of the people who contribute to DeviantArt, at least all of those who were sufficiently good to merit ratings, and now we've got a mechanism for certification. And people, and this actually happens, in DeviantArt, they go to the, say, uh, you know, commercial advertising art department, and they say, you know, look, uh, I'm rated 47th on DeviantArt. Here, here are my reviews. Here's some of my work. 
uh, it doesn't matter that I don't have a BFA. So, I, and I think that's the direction we're moving in, in work generally. This certificates thing, I think, is, uh, you know, it's shorthand that we used because we didn't have data. Now we have data. So we don't need to use it anymore. Uh, that, that was uh, sort of the answer that I was half hoping that would come because even though I'm involved in higher education, I feel that higher education is too powerful and that it needs alternative forms of validating what people have learned, even to make higher education better, but really to give people more options for learning and more options for making a living. Um, uh, Eva put his hand up and I gave him control of the mic. Eva, if, you, if you've got your mic working, you're free to ask a question there. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. It was really interesting. Do you hear me? I hear you yes. perfectly. Um, yeah, uh, I'm wondering, um, um, I think we have come across um, uh, Isa Jana's uh, theory or model about the cross, um, about, uh, cross action spaces and how we learn through cross action spaces. And I'm wondering if um, uh, if you would like to reflect something about that uh, related to what you are talking about, uh, collectivism and uh, how we learn to collaboration and connections. Could you give me <laughs> sentences, sentences telling me telling what uh, you mean by Because it's new to me. Go again, yeah. Stephen. Can you give me a few sentences telling me what you mean by cross-action learning spaces? Because this is new to me. Sorry, I, Eva, I, I disabled your microphone. You'll have to put it on again. Yeah. Uh, she mean with uh, cross-action uh, learning spaces. For example, if um, you know if we are sitting in a um, some kind of uh, event and we are. Um, Collaborating on a, in a in a in a certain topic, and then, uh, for example, like, like we have the uh, right now with your webinar, um, people maybe were tweeting, they were blogging, they were connecting other people who were not in our space. So other people with uh, outside our web webinar, so to say, also come um, come uh, across what we have been discussing in this webinar. So that means that we reach out to a much larger group than are in our webinar because we are tweeting, we are blogging, we are chatting maybe with others, we are telling both physical and virtual uh, about what has happened here, uh, both in real time but also in uh, asynchronous time. Uh, was it some kind of explanation? And that is really what, what you are talking about, I mean, connect, connectivism as well, we are connecting all the time in different kind of settings. Yeah. But, uh, it's what I would call a, a distributed environment. Um, distributed in the sense that not everything is happening in the same place. And I've actually tried to foster that even in this talk with the discussion in Twitter, which is kind of dead. Uh, Twitter, you disappoint me. <laughs> uh, with, the, uh, with the YouTube Live version uh, as well as what's happening here. and. I, I expect that this seminar will have a, a community over the days and months ahead based on people looking at this. How much they'll talk about this, who knows, right? Um, this is also what we did in, um, in, well, in our first connectivism course. Um, we encouraged people to create their own spaces. Um, create blogs, to create delicious link feeds, to, uh, to use groups, um, and people did. They, there were three separate second life groups that were formed. There were discussion groups that were formed, there were Facebook groups that were formed, and this is what we wanted because we don't, especially in the case of a massive open online course, you don't want a hundred thousand people in the same environment. You know, oh sure, you, you can do that if all you're doing is broadcasting videos. 
but if you're trying to make things interact, do things, converse, argue, etc., it can't happen all in one place. Just can't. So what we wanted to do is have multiple environments where this could happen, and then try to make the link between these. Uh, it's what the Canadian politician Joe Clark used to call community of communities, and, and that was the model we were after. This also addresses the Twitter comment. Uh, Telltales is saying, you need an environment to create a chorus to explain and learn. Yeah. When he comments, yes, but who owns the spaces and why isn't this important? This is incredibly important. Um, I, I have an item going in the newsletter today from Dean Groom. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a stream of consciousness article on his part. But basically, what he's saying is that uh, modern learning technology, especially social learning technology, has become, in the hands of educators, uh, nonstop advertisements for a few companies. And I could name them, right? Google, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so, you know, even, even this presentation, I've mentioned Twitter a dozen times, I've mentioned Google a dozen times, uh, I've avoided mentioning Facebook because I don't like them, but, uh, but even them I've mentioned a bunch of times. Um, yeah, and they own these spaces. That's why I have MySpace. That's why I've tried to develop a concept of a personal learning environment. But, you know, that's really hard to get any of these commercial enterprises to buy into, right? Because it's not a space that they own. So, yeah, huge, important, totally important question. That occupies me a lot. Okay, everyone. Um, I haven't seen any questions coming in on the chat area, so there. Uh, I'll, uh, I think we'll bring it to a close. When I was introducing uh, Stephen at the start, my connection died for about thirty seconds, and Stephen uh, very quickly and spontaneously got stuck in, which was great. Um, so uh, I'd like to take this time again to thank him. Uh, his ideas are just unbelievably stimulating. Um, I think he asks very fundamental questions and very difficult ones, as he says, even there uh, in the last few sentences, that there are difficulties about who owns spaces. We're working in this open area with commercial companies. There are so many questions that are difficult to answer. And <clears throat> Stephen certainly stimulates us to think about these and to come up with solutions, as I say. <clears throat> I'm working in the area of accredited education, and I need to use these ideas of open education to make what we do more relevant, even if it makes us less important. So again, Stephen, thank you for your ideas, and thank you for contributing. And thank you, everybody, for attending.